The Barbarian Philosopher Podcast is back after a long hiatus. Thank you for watching. I am your host, Jerome Acevedo. I'm going to be joined by audio by my good friend, Jason Foreman, and we're doing a review of UFC 229, Habib vs. McGregor. Thank you for watching. Let's get it going. Jason, how's it going, brother? Hey, Jerome. Thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. This is really exciting, and uh, can't wait to geek out about some MMA. I love it. No doubt, man. <laughs> So, uh, obviously, everyone wants to hear about the Khabib thing, um, but before we do mm -hmm. that, let's kind of go over some of the prelim cards. Uh, Michelle Watterson versus, uh, versus Herrig. What, what were your thoughts on that fight? Um, it, was, it was pretty nuts. I like how Michelle Watterson, who, by the way, like, she looks like a fitness model or something like that. Like, she doesn't look... Like a crazy fighter, she right. opened up with the with the high kick. I thought that was cool. Right. Yeah, I was um, going into that fight. I was really, really, I I, I kind of favored Michelle for this fight. I felt like uh, her her footwork and her elusiveness was going to be a bit much for for Herrig. Um, Felice has been, you know, kind of relatively flat footed. She likes to plant and try to get power. Uh, but what I was really impressed with there was uh, Michelle's ability to kind of nullify a lot of Herrig's strength in the clinch. Like, she she managed to get quite a few takedowns. She stuffed a lot of uh, Felice's takedowns. I, I was really, really impressed by that. And Michelle Watterson, she's more known for kickboxing, right? She's not so much a wrestler. I haven't really followed her too much. Yeah, so she's known uh, for, you know, karate, kickboxing, her, her stand-up. But she has actually a really good, her, her, her jiu-jitsu is really solid. Uh, she has, I think, um, before submitting, if I remember correctly, she submitted Herrig. Uh, before submitting uh, Herrig, she had like nine submission wins under her belt as opposed to Herrig's uh, four submissions. Uh, so her, her groundwork is, is worth respecting. Um, that was actually one of the comments even Rose Namahunis made. Uh, after their fight that she had to kind of really train and be mindful going in that Watterson has a very tricky ground game. And so I, I, I wasn't too surprised that she was, you know, good off of her back. But definitely her ability to score takedowns on Herrig, who just looking, you can tell she's a much stronger and physically imp uh, imposing woman. And then also to handle herself in the clinch like she did. I, I was super impressed by that. Huh, so takedowns, is that is that her evolving or she was always like she always had those skills as a grappler? Um, she's she's had some some decent judo throws in her background. I don't think that's been like her go to uh bread and butter, but um just to see her get it off on somebody like like Felice. Because Felice is kind of known for, you know, her wrestling. She started out as a kickboxer, but her wrestling has evolved quite a bit. And she's, you know, gotten some some decent recognition for her ability to clinch people into the into the fence and take them down from there and to shoot and get her takedowns. So it was really cool to see uh, the karate hottie uh, kind of uh, nullify that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. That was that was pretty cool. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I would like to see, and you know, I. I don't know if it would be her next fight, but if she continues in the direction that she's going now, I think a Rose Nama Yunus, uh Michelle Watterson rematch for the belt is not in in the near future uh, is not absurd or too far of a, a bridge to to cross. That'd be cool to watch, um, and then maybe she's got a little more because uh, I, I don't follow the women as closely. But uh, how do I say it, jo Joanna Jacek? Uh huh. Jacek, did she really have anything to offer with grappling or anything else that was scary besides her her nasty, nasty kicks and striking? Like she never gets tired, she hits hard. But like, was there anything else for Rose to watch out besides just striking? You know? I don't think so. I think uh, you know Joanna, and to hell if I know how to pronounce her last name. <laughs> uh, but Joanna is her her. Her grappling is more based along the lines of her takedown defense. 
you know, mm -hmm. she has good defensive grappling, the ability to sprawl and stop the takedown. But I can't uh -huh. say that she's uh, known to be threatening off of her back or or be you know a, a submission uh, titan or anything like that. Her main thing is I'm gonna fuck you up on on the feet, and if you try to shoot, I'm gonna sprawl and punish you for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Um, obviously, we got to talk about Derek Hot Balls Lewis versus uh, Volkov. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of that fight, man? Uh, that was pretty incredible. I was watching it with my family, and they didn't really get it. Like, at the end of the third round, mm -hmm. how everybody was just like, they looked kind of slow and flat-footed. And they were like, why are these guys moving so slow? And I'm, like, trying to explain, like, it's the middle of the third round, and they were really just trying to, like, just go at it. You know, they were really trying to knock each other out. And at that point, like, it's it's really tough, you know? To, right. And also, they're big guys, too. Was, is this heavyweight or light heavyweight? Um, I believe that's heavyweight. Oh, that's heavyweight. I believe. Don't don't quote me 100%, but if I'm not mistaken, that uh, they're at heavyweight. Yeah, I I really I've not been following Volkov too closely. I just know anytime anybody mentions him, like he's a beast, he's on a roll. You know who can stop him? He's getting momentum. And uh, well, what do you think? It looked like he was doing a good job at using his range. He's longer, you know, picking him apart, push kicking him to get distance. Yeah, I I you know he played the tall man's game like he was supposed to. Um, I think the, the, the main thing, the, the, the main point of interest, at least for me in that fight is, uh, obviously Derek Lewis's heart and his ability to come back in the end. But before that, uh, you know, I've noticed, and this is very common, especially amongst the heavier weights is okay. Derek Lewis likes to just kind of sit and wait. And get that big one shot or one or two punches that are going to land and do maximum damage. And I think he would do very well to start working on, you know, doubling and tripling up on his jab. Or creating, uh, you know, combinations that have more than one or two punches on them to help him close that distance. Because if you look at the Nganu fight, uh, if you look at this fight... If the person doesn't come in and engage with him, he has a really hard time closing that gap. Oh. Uh, so what, what does he do? He Like what I saw, he just kind of seems to just bank on the fact that I'll be quicker this time or I'll get there first. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It definitely seems like he his MO is to kind of try to wait for the person to punch or, you know, whatever combination they're going to throw and then counter them on the way in. And, you know, I'm like you said, I'm going to land before he lands on me, and what I land will do more damage. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really risky. So, like, what you're saying is, it sounds like, I don't know, I'm not too much of, too knowledgeable in particular with striking, but I think it sounds like he does need to mix it up a little bit more instead of just throwing a big-ass, you know, overhand like just trying to connect right down the middle, you know, trying to sneak something else in before that. It looked like he was kind of loading up and just throwing those big ones. I remember thinking that's not going to work. Right. And he's going to see it coming. Right, right. And it's like... But it did. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, well, that's one thing. It's weird with Derek Lewis is he's one of those guys that finds a way to win. He's one of those guys that will get beat and mm -hmm. take damage for the majority of the fight and then out of nowhere... Bam, he gets that one good crack that turns everything around, you know, and um, I mean, look, it's worked for him thus far. He's gotten this far in the game utilizing it, but it, I think people are, are getting wise, uh, especially as he progresses and moves higher up in the ranks. People are getting wise to the fact that if you just kind of play, you stay at a distance, you don't engage him too much, you know, he, he a lot of what he has is nullified. Um What's his name at the end? Volkov, I think, got kind of lured into the fact that uh, he had spent a lot of time just kind of laying in wait, laying in wait, and got comfortable coming in. And mm -hmm. uh, Derek Lewis finally kind of turned it up a little bit and started throwing more than just one or two punch towards the end. Uh, and I think that's what allowed him to kind of land that big punch. It's, it's, it seems really important to me, especially for a guy like him, 
to be able to throw a combination where maybe the first one, two, or three strikes don't land, but those get you to the one that will land. I think he'll do a lot better if he can incorporate that. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. And then that way he could sneak in the big shots behind those small ones instead of just going for broke and uh, and just like winding up and showing, hey, this is what's coming, you know? Right, right. No doubt. No doubt. Um, how, about when he, <laughs> how about when he won and he took off his shorts? <laughs> He said his balls were too hot or something like that. <laughs> Derek Lewis is a fool, man. Uh, all his post-fight interviews are, are pretty entertaining. Um, yeah. I, I, I can't, can't think... understand what he's saying, though. He's kind of like Boomhauer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he definitely has that Southern thing going on. It shouldn't be Black Beats. It should be Boomhauer. Right, right, right. Um, he's just like, hey, man, Joe Rogan. I'm going to go on your show. What is that? I'm going to go on that show with you and smoke some weed or something. Yeah, yeah. I would love to hear that. Uh, I think that would be an, a super entertaining uh, episode of the Joe Rogan Podcast. Um, Derek Lewis is a really funny dude. One of the things that I like a lot about him, especially when you do get to hear him speak, is he's mm-hmm. unabashedly honest about where he is. There's not a lot of bravado. So you'll hear him all, oftentimes, like his fight w- uh, against Nganu, uh, this fight mm-hmm. here. He'll, he'll say straight up, like, man, I'm not ready for a title shot. They, they shouldn't offer me a title shot. You know, I'm, I'm lacking in technique here. I'm lacking in my cardio. And he's really, really brutally honest about where he is uh, in his development. And I really appreciate that. So I think uh, getting to hear him kind of discuss where he is, getting to get a good long form format sense of his sense of humor, um, I, I, I think that'd be a, that'd be a very interesting episode to catch. Yeah, it it would be, and like even just the way he was like laying on the floor and like napping and just like <laughs> there was, I mean, he was tired, but there was some humor in that too. Like it was just like right. I don't know, he's just kind of goofy. Yeah, you know, what? it kind of reminds me of like a sleepier version of like Rampage's humor, like Rampage. When he would joke, you'd be like, wait, is that really a joke or is he just kind of crazy and he just did that? Right, right. Yeah, I could, I could definitely see that. I can definitely see um, Lewis being kind of, like, kind of like a more mellow, turned down version of Rampage in that sense. Did you see in between rounds when his corner was like, all right, fuck it. You got to win. Yeah. He's like, we're behind. This is it. Just give me this win. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely caught that. Um, I'm, it's hard for me to tell with a guy like Lewis whether his inactivity in the beginning was purely just him waiting for that big shot or him trying to manage his cardio knowing that that's not a strong point of his. Him kind of saying, okay, I'm going to reserve until the last round and then really trying to turn it, turn it up there. And that's, that's a, an issue I'd like to, I would like to see get covered uh, if and when he does I uh, get a chance to converse with Joe Rogan. You know what that kind of reminds me of? Uh, I don't know if you listen to Chael Sonnen's podcast, but mm-hmm. Chael Sonnen mentioned something a little bit in MMA, but mostly in boxing. And he was kind of calling out this like traditional point of view of uh, you know the first two minutes of uh, of of like a stand up fight or any fight that includes boxing or kickboxing. Uh, and the commentators said, oh, you know, they're feeling each other out, and they're just, mm-hmm. you know, they're testing things. And what he said, I thought it was kind of interesting, uh, and kind of going back to what Derek Lewis did, how he was, like, more sleepy, less, not throwing as much, is, um, all right, Shel Sona said this. He said it's like a nonverbal agreement between two, two guys. Oh, we know we can't go full 12 rounds or five championship, you know, rounds. And we'll be exhausted. So it's like this informal agreement that they're both going to conserve energy. And they can't go the full, you know, whatever it is, time a lot of three minutes, five minutes. Right. Right. Yeah, I, th- I think there's definitely some of that. I think there are some guys who's just, you know, whether it's due to genetics, whether it's due to their workout regimen, whether it's due to whatever it's due to, they have that crazy, insane cardio and they can come out full fire from the first round all the way through. But for most people, it definitely does at least seem from the outside looking in uh, as if, you know, it's kind of understood, I don't want to blow my load in the first round, Uh you know. So 
whether that's due to them filling each other out, and I'm sure there is some of that, and and I get uh, Chelsea's point there. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I I think there is kind of a period of you're 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 trying to feel out what this guy's timing is like. What is you know uh, how does he slip or how does he counter when I throw this jab or when I when I go to throw my leg kick or you do kind of feel each other out a little bit. But I don't know that that's necessarily the sole reason why people are a little bit slower in that first round or two. So Chelsea and very well may have a point there. Yeah. Yeah, or, or maybe in this case, maybe Derek Lewis, more than filling out, he was saving his energy. Yeah, I, I, I think that has a lot to do with it. I, I certainly hope so. I certainly hope uh, that has a lot to do with it and that it's not just entirely him kind of uh, praying that he lands that big overhand. <laughs> it kind of seemed like that. It definitely does. It definitely does. Uh, yeah, but I, I just going back to his corner, I need this fucking win. You're behind... You know, like, this is it. It's, you're down every round, and you're not going to... No, there's no upset other than actually just laying this guy out. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, yeah, right. Like, it's just going to be a, a decision. Both mm-hmm. guys look tired and kind of flat-footed, mm-hmm. and he's going to keep you at bay. Mm-hmm. And he kept swinging those wild ones. Some of them keep seem like... Let's see. They kind of seem to come from, like, way outside, right? And they're, yeah. like, too obvious. Yeah. Then what changed? Like, I'm trying to think back, like... You know, I think uh, some of it is just he he, he got the timing right. He managed to uh, catch instead of... How how can I put this? Instead of... He was feeling it out. What's that? He was feeling it out, like, throughout the fight. He was feeling it out, but I think it was also an issue of just, I'm going to keep throwing these out there. And with everything that you throw, the more you throw out, you know, one of them, there's there's a chance one of them is going to land. So I think that's a part of it. I think uh, he just managed to time Volkov coming in on a combination because just going off of memory, if I remember correctly, Volkov was in the middle of, you know, getting ready to throw a kick. So he Uh was in a position where he couldn't really retreat or undo the momentum that he had thought that he had put himself forward uh, into. And so I think timing that better was to Derek Lewis's uh, advantage. And then I think he started throwing more. He, he, you know, came out a little bit more aggressive in that last round and wasn't just throwing one big shot. He was, you know, trying to throw one, two, three shots at a time uh, to help cover that distance. And I think that that really helped him out in that. Okay, yeah, I remember that, especially later in the final round. It wasn't just, like you said, it wasn't that one, and then he started wising up, okay, two, and then three. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I think the other thing was he got a little smarter where he's not just like, oh, I just want to put this guy down. Yeah, if, if I remember correctly, they were both, like, approaching each other, right? Mm-hmm. And he interrupted his rhythm, mm-hmm. and he kind of sliced through. Exactly. It was almost like that King Velasquez over the, over the hand, uh, overhand between the, the two hands. Yeah, yeah, he definitely came through and broke the guard with that. That was so nice how it connected. Yeah, man, and I, you know, I, I was really, really, really happy for Derek Lewis because you know after that Nganu performance, you know, uh, he, he, I, I think he really needed this win. He's been on a nice tear of wins lately, but uh, I think that was just such a bad performance on both parties involved that if he had lost this one as well. Uh, it would have lowered his market his market ability and his kind of bargaining uh, power going forward. You know, um, mm-hmm. so I, I was just really happy for him that he got this win because I, I do think that he needed it and for his mental as well. You know, you you start you get a loss, you get a second loss, you get a bad performance. That kind of fucks with the fighter's uh, mind frame, and they go into the next fight oftentimes uh, with a compromised view of themselves if they start accruing too many losses or too many bad performances in a row. He really did hang in there, huh? Like, he really believed in himself, especially at the end. Uh-huh. And then maybe it was emotional. It wasn't just going back to the corner, catching your breath, getting some, like, ice on his head, wake him up. Maybe, like, what his corner said, like, actually put some fire into him. You right. know? Like, he kind of changed up a little bit after that. Yeah, definitely, and uh, you know, I, I would, I mean, I'm not in the man's head, neither of us are, 
but I, I think you know uh, being the corner man being the coach of your fighter and kind of knowing how to to trigger that emotion how to trigger uh, their mentality to get them where you need them to be to perform in the way you need them perfor to perform is super super crucial and it's an interesting yep. aspect of the game that I don't think gets reviewed very much that's what they say Greg Jackson is like a miracle worker that's what they say yeah. that's where like his genius is not just in fighting and strategizing the fight but yeah it's like that psychological um, how do I say it like just knowing his fighter and knowing how to reach his fighter knowing what makes him confident and yeah. how to keep him in that zone even if the chips are down yeah yeah no doubt I mean, look, man, having a good corner man and having somebody who knows how to talk to you and knows how to keep your, your mind right is, is a valuable asset to, to any corner, you know, or to any fighter, rather. Yeah, and hopefully you know how to do that to yourself, too. Like, uh, you know, if anybody ever fought in a boxing match or competed in jiu-jitsu, you know when, like, oh, shit, you get mounted. All right, calm mm -hmm. the fuck down. And you know how to, you know how to, you've been here before, and you know how to escape, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's a huge part, huh? Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Um, your self-perception and your self-talk, but I think it's, it's very easy to get flustered in the moments. Now, some people are just impenetrable. It seems like, you know, there are some fighters who just their natural way of being, their natural way of speaking uh, to themselves or their way that they think, is such that it, it kind of allows them to plow through and keep their momentum and not get down or not get discouraged. But for individuals who are not like that or who may be a little bit wavy when it comes to that, having a good corner, man, having a good corner is a major deal. It's an advantage for sure. What did you? What were your thoughts on the uh, Ferguson versus Pettis? That was that was a super exciting fight. I loved that fight. Super, super, super happy to see Ferguson come back after that injury ordeal and you know come back strong. Um, before I give my my take on it, I want to hear yours. Um, so well, hold on a second. Let's recap. Ferguson, when he got injured, that wasn't even from fighting or training, right? just like slipped on a cord or some stupid shit like that yeah there was it was a uh, leading into Habib the, a fight with Habib the most mm -hmm. recent fight that uh, Habib was supposed to have and I believe it was like the night before that they were actually supposed to fight he was doing some kind of a uh, presser or something like that and he was you know walking around backstage and just freak accident tripped on a cord that was there and like blew, just completely blew the ligaments on the side of his knee off the bone just total freak accident and you know boom end of fight no 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 more uh ferguson versus habib yeah yeah i mean he was the guy to either stop mcgregor or khabib right ruin khabib's perfect record and we didn't really get to find out yeah and it's crazy i don't know what it is about him and habib but like the two of them, they just cannot get a fight. They, uh, not including the last one, they were supposed to fight like another three or four times and something always happens. Either uh, Habib missed weight or he had to pull out because, you know, he was hospitalized for cutting too much weight or I forgot uh, something happened with Tony Ferguson. He had to pull out like yeah. those two for whatever reason, like the universe is just not digging the idea of those two fighting. And it was actually kind of weird to finally see the two of them, although not fighting each other, on the same fight card and actually yeah. make it through to the end. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, though. I don't think we're missing much, though, because I think I love watching Tony Ferguson fight. And he kind of fights a little unorthodox, a little, like, doesn't give a shit, you know? Yeah. But, uh, and I even watched him when he was on The Ultimate Fighter. Who was the coach? The coach was, uh, Frank Mir or something like that? It was, like, Frank Mir versus Brock Lesnar? Possibly. I, to be honest with you, I, I, I couldn't tell you. I don't follow The Ultimate Fighter too closely. Oh, man. So. Yeah. Well, I remember I watched Tony Ferguson, and he was one of the few guys that actually had good jiu-jitsu. Mm -hmm. And he was really slick when he was passing the guard. And in Flash Four, he, you know, he goes with Eddie Bravo, and, uh, and yeah, like, I, I would root for Tony Ferguson, but I, I honestly, I don't think we're missing much, because I think Khabib, his wrestling and his, 
you know, top style jujitsu and everything that he has, all of his pressure, I think it would just nullify Tony Ferguson. Like, I think, I don't think he has a takedown defense for Khabib either. I just think it would be not that exciting to watch and it would be, you know, Khabib just doing what he does. Huh. I think out of everybody in the lightweight division, I think Tony Ferguson has the highest chance of, of beating Khabib. Um, uh-huh. Doesn't necessarily mean he will, but I think he has the highest probability of doing that. Uh, you know, if you look at um, the fight that Khabib just had with Ally Quinta, right? A lot of why, you know, Ally Quinta did as well as he did is he has a solid wrestling background and he was able to stuff quite a few of uh, Habib's takedowns. He was able to keep Habib up on the feet. Um, and Tony Ferguson comes from, from a pretty high level wrestling background as well. That's where he, that's how he actually ended up getting into MMA was uh, he was recruited by, I forget what gym, to be their wrestling coach. Yeah, and then he started, you know, getting involved in the other aspects and kind of started growing from there. So he has a wrestling base. Uh, he has pretty good takedown defense. Um, his ju- his jujitsu from the bottom is pretty high level. And to make a point, and this is going to play in later when we get to uh, Habib versus Connor, uh, Ed, uh, uh, Tony Ferguson's jujitsu coach is Eddie Bravo, and he Eddie Bravo mentioned on one of his uh, interviews with Joe Rogan that should they fight. What Eddie Bravo believes would be the key there is to instead of spending his time from the bottom wasting energy trying to get back up to his feet Uh is to just accept, okay, if I'm going to get taken down, let me land in guard and then I'm going to work from the guard. I'm going to actually work from the guard. And nobody prior to this fight, UFC 229, has really taken that approach. Everybody, as soon as they get taken down, it's like, I got to get back up. I got to get back up. I got to get back up. Mm-hmm. And that engagement, that uh, back and forth of Habib dragging them down, them, okay, I finally get a hand free, post that hand up, Habib pulls it back in. Okay, I'm, I'm getting up, I'm getting up. Habib ties up the legs. Okay, I get my leg free. Okay, boom, Habib pulls the arm back in. That ordeal wears people out so much. And I think uh, it was a very interesting uh, thing that... Eddie Bravo mentioned, and we'll we'll let the later result of that play in later when we get to Habib versus McGregor. But I think uh, Tony Ferguson, although maybe wouldn't be able to submit Habib, uh, his elbows from the bottom are pretty vicious, and his ability to kind of accept his position there and at least threaten things to occupy Habib, uh, I, I, I think he has at least a chance there. And then, of course, he has such a bizarre and unorthodox striking style. I don't know how Habib would uh, would train for that. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I could see that, too. Yeah. Uh, it, it is pretty good. It's pretty cool of a guy with such high-level wrestling that he's good off his back, too. Yeah, because... You're right. When you when you think of you know somebody who started out as a wrestler, very seldom do you th- do you see them switch over to a predominantly jujitsu style of of grappling. Yeah. Yeah, man. So, so uh, what, what do you think? Um, like, what do you think was the defining factor that did Pettis in? It was the cut. Or was I'm like not so knocked around from the ground and pound or what? Uh, in the corner, basically they they called it quits. Pettis said he broke his hand, uh, and all oh, right, 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 yeah. Duke he Rufus, there was like a point where his, his he's like moving his hand around, and Duke Rufus is like, dude, is your hand broke? Is your hand broke? Tell me if your hand's broke. I'm not gonna send you out there if your hand is broken. Is your hand broke? And he kept pressing him on it. And so uh, Pettis said that he broke his hand, and Duke Rufus called the fight. Which, uh, and this is a point that Joe Rogan brought up, and I think it's a worthwhile point. You don't see corners very often in MMA pull their fighter out of a fight. The last time that I can think of that happening, uh, that sticks in my mind, was Nick Diaz pulled his brother Nate. I forgot who he was fighting, 
but he threw in the towel basically and pulled his brother in. Um, you don't see very often where a coach or a corner will throw the towel in for the sake of the fighter's well-being. And so that was very interesting to, to watch. Um, part of it, though, I think also is Pettis may have broke a little bit under that pressure. Um, I can't say for certain, but I do get the feeling that uh, Tony's just constant forward pressure, uh, his ability... Something that's crazy about Tony Ferguson is he's willing to sit there in the in the firefight and take damage to give damage. And I think he does it in a way that most people have a hard time dealing with. And I think that kind of that 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 pressure, uh, along with the cardio pressure of Tony Ferguson, may have broke uh, Pettis a little bit mentally. And then the broken hand on top of that just kind of pushed it over the edge. Yeah, he looked pretty bad, and it looked like a street fighter when the guy loses his face <laughs> cut up. It was just, like, very dramatic. Yeah, man. Yeah, his face man. was glowing red, and he was getting smacked up. It was not looking good. I think that was the right call. What do you think? <laughs> uh... I mean, I can I can never be mad at somebody for you know saying hey like I this is I need to stop here. It, it, you know yourself if you're the coach, you know your fighter, you know what they are and aren't capable of doing, and what they are and aren't willing to go through. And if the fighter and or the coach is like, hey man, that's it. I, I gotta respect it. I'm not mad at it. Um, I feel like Pettis. You've seen plenty of fighters. Uh, continue on with a broken hand. Um, the last fight that that uh, Zabit, uh, I I can't pronounce these Eastern European names, but Zabit Mahaba, I can't say his last name. Zabit, the last fight he had, he had a broken hand uh, going into the fight. Um, Derek Lewis, in this fight he had on UFC 29, kept reaching to his eye, and it was uh, presumed by Joe Rogan and everyone commentating that he likely had a broken uh, orbital socket. Um, we've definitely seen fighters continue on and push forward with with severe injury and make it to a win or at least get to the end of the fight. So I don't think it's an issue that he couldn't have went forward, but that was the decision that they made. And, you know, you got to respect it. Ultimately, they're the ones in there. They're the ones putting their body on the lines, not the viewer. And so if they decide, okay, I've reached as far as I'm willing to go, you got to just kind of like, all right, it is what it is. Yeah, wasn't it GSP? I forgot who he was fighting, and he broke his thumb or some shit, or he broke his whole hand, and then Greg, Jas Greg Jackson told him, hit him with your hands. Yeah, that you was, uh, I think that was, that was uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, John Jones. Is it Nick Diaz? Oh. If it was Greg, if it was Greg Jackson, I believe it, it might have been John Jones. Oh, really? I think so. That might have been... The fight when he fought uh, Vitor and Vitor extended his arm and jacked up his arm. Oh yeah! And then uh, he he went back to the corner holding his arm and Jackson was like, "Hit him with that hand." If I remember correctly, oh. it was it was the Vitor John Jones, and I'm sure it's happened before. I'm sure other fighters and coaches have probably had that same dialogue. I just remember GSP saying it with his eyes. Hit him with it. Okay. He done with it, or what? I'm not doing it good right now, but, uh, oh man, John Jones, man, that motherfucker's tough. Or how about when he fought Chael and his toe snapped, like almost clean off? Like yeah, that that, that's a perfect example of some, and he didn't even know it. He didn't even know it until after the interview, or after the really? fight when he was being interviewed. Adrenaline. Yeah. He's sitting on the stool, he's like, something's wrong with my toe here. Yeah, man, that's crazy. Or, uh, or freaking just like we were talking about earlier, before, just when we were chatting, uh, Jessica I when her ear like fucking like tore off. <laughs> like, what the hell? Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, Jamie Varner, I believe. I forgot who he was fighting. He was fighting somebody, and like broke his ankle and m went through the rest of the round. Like you would literally see him put his foot down and just his whole foot would just roll over. Because he had broke his ankle and he just went through the whole fight like that. Went through the whole round, got to the end of it. So there's definitely been a precedent set before of people being willing to push through it. It's just whether or not that's a good idea and whether or not the individual at play is willing to do it. Oh, in the long run for your health, 
is definitely not a good idea. But yeah, definitely I mean, if not. you're going to get the victory, or if, you know, you you think you could still win, then maybe it is. Right. Well, here's an old school one. Remember this? I don't know if you remember this. Kurt Pellegrino, Batman. Remember, he got punched, and his tooth hit his lower lip, and there was a hole through his mouth. Uh, I can't say I remember that one, no. There was literally a hole, like somebody took a hole puncher and like just punched out, like you could see his tooth through the mouth. Okay, I'll have to go back and look that one up. Fucking hardcore. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. Um, <laughs> I, I think going forward for Tony Ferguson, uh, and again, super happy for him, super happy to see him kind of come back from the mm-hmm. injury and look as good as he did. Uh... Assuming Habib does not get cut from the UFC, uh, that he you know remains a, a a viable fighter within the UFC, or that he's not banned for too long, um, mm-hmm. Tony versus Habib is I, I think that's the next one, man. That'd be sick. Remember uh, Tony's little? Oh man, I mean, I like watching Tony as a fighter, but sometimes a little cringy, like the stuff he says. <laughs> he tried to do his own Nick Diaz thing. Where you at? Uh, Oh, no, no, I mean, Nate Diaz. He tried to do the Conor McGregor. Were you at Conor? Like, it just... Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, his his uh, his trash talking definitely comes across a little bit odd, to say the least. Awkward, um, yeah. It, it's definitely weird. It's definitely weird. But that being said, I super enjoy... I just don't listen to his interviews, basically. You know, because I, I have a hard <laughs> time getting through it. But as a fighter, man... I certainly enjoy watching him fight. Super entertaining, super tough, super unique style. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where he goes from here. All right, what would you be more excited to see? Would you be more excited to see Tony Ferguson versus Conor McGregor or Tony Ferguson versus Khabib? Which one? Ferguson versus Khabib, I, I would be more really? excited for. Yeah. Yeah. Um,. Just, I think there's more, obviously there'd be more at stake there because there's a belt on the line. Um, mm-hmm. To finally have those two actually get to fight after all of these uh, failed attempts, I think would kind of add to it a bit. And to see somebody who's willing to sit in the guard with Habib and who has a, a developed ground game, I think would be interesting from a technical point of view. From, ex- okay. from, an ex- from an excitement point of view, I think for sure uh, Ferguson versus McGregor would probably be a more exciting fight. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, Ferguson versus uh, Habib would be a more interesting technical fight. That's pretty fucking badass, actually. I didn't think of that. Like, maybe Tony Ferguson just, like, really doesn't give a fuck. And Habib will take him down, and he's just like, okay... Mm. Here we go. I'm gonna work my guard instead of like everybody is so like either frightened of Khabib's takedowns or trying to get back up right away so we could do our striking or whatever. That would be cool to see somebody just confidently just play the guard like Vinny Bravo suggested. Yeah, I, I think, and you know, I think that's the way to go about it. And we saw a little bit of that in the Khabib versus uh, McGregor fight. Um, <clears throat> so just moving straight forward into that. I was really, really, really impressed by both individuals. They both did well, relatively well, in the area that it was assumed they would do horrible at. So, you know, uh, Habib landed that big overhand right. He managed to to knock down McGregor. Um, He managed to actually stay in front of McGregor and exchange on the feet quite a bit more than what I expected he would go into. And McGregor, during that first round, if you think back to... Michael Johnson, if you think back to uh, Etchen Barbosa, whenever uh-huh. people get taken down by uh, Habib, the, the damage is, comes right away and they get beat the fuck up. First round, they get taken down, they're just getting mauled. That first round, you didn't really see McGregor take a lot of damage on the ground. Uh, uh-huh. he, he got taken down, he didn't spend a lot of energy trying to get back to his feet. And I, I didn't catch the full thing, but there's an episode right now of uh, Kavanaugh, McGregor's coach, on the JRE, the Joe Rogan Experience. And that was one of the things that they planned going in. Is like, look, if and when he takes you down, don't burn all your energy trying to get back up. Just, you know, work your guard. 
Try not to give up position. Try not to take damage, but just work your guard. And we saw McGregor get through that first round with very, very, very minimal damage. And McGregor yeah. doesn't have the submission game that Tony Ferguson has. So we got to see a little sneak preview, at least, of how that might play out for people who have a developed guard game to just embrace the grind and like, okay, I'm here, let's just work from here. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. Uh, I uh, Wow, that's weird. So the plan was to just kind of chill there and to, I mean, not to chill there, but to not expend as much energy. He did do a good job of like not getting his face smashed, at least in round one. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's good advice, though, man, because, like, dude, like, have, have you ever, like, uh, rolled with a guy who is good at smashing guard? It's just, like, it's so frustrating that you can't do anything. And then on top of that in MMA, like, even though you have guard in MMA, it's not a neutral position, they can still rain down punches. Even if it doesn't happen emotionally, that war is still there. Yeah. Like, I don't know if that was a good idea because Khabib is so comfortable there. He just waits and gravity is working against you. It's definitely, I, I think, I agree with what you're saying. It's, it's, it's not generally a good idea. And I don't think that the plan was like, if the opportunity to get back up presents itself, let it pass you by. But right, right. don't Before struggle time. for it. Don't struggle for it. Um, oh, and I think it's kind it. of like you're picking the lesser of two evils, you know. Do you want your pinky cut off or do you want your hand cut off? Either way, it's a bad idea. But if you got to choose one, choose the one that works out best in your favor. And I think the idea of not trying to expend all of your energy trying to get back up the whole time, trying to force an opportunity against a guy like Habib, uh, Habib against a guy like Habib, uh, who... Like, that's such a big part of his game plan is just to wear you down and break you down by constantly dragging you, tying up your legs, you free your legs, getting the wrist ride, you free the wrist, wrist ride, getting the mount, you get out of the mount, gets the legs tied up again. That whole dance that he does just burns people out with their gas, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I remember I experienced that firsthand. I was in a jiu-jitsu tournament, and this guy was just smashing the shit out of everybody. Mm -hmm. And he was picking them up and double-legging them, slamming their backs on the mat. And then when he wasn't doing that, he was sitting in their guard, and he didn't give a fuck about their guard. I was like, who is this guy? He just didn't care. Mm -hmm. He sat in their guard, and then he wasn't really, like, urgent about passing the guard. I was like, what the hell is he doing? Break the guard so you can... No, he, he was wearing on the guy from inside the guard. He mm -hmm. really just didn't give a fuck. And his mm -hmm. balance was so good. And he knew just enough to negate submissions. Mm -hmm. so then it was time for me to fight him. And I had recently come from judo. Okay. So my style was... It was aggressive like his, but not with wrestling and not with top game. It was aggressive with some judo takedowns and with submissions. Okay. And so I did this crap where, <laughs> where I kind of like old school, like Nogueira, like pulling guard, pretending that you're hurt or unbalanced. Uh -huh. So I did in judo, I did what happened in judo. I pushed against the guy, okay. and then once he pushed back, I'm like, oh, this fucker's aggressive. So he's going to push back. And then, you know, the tomoe nage where you throw him up with your legs? Uh-huh. Uh, he's going to pursue me, and I'll throw him with that. He'll be on his back, or he'll fall into an arm bar. And when I pushed him, I was really, he was shocked that I was pushing him because he's very strong. And, you know, everybody's been watching. He's been slamming the shit out of people. And I was a little confused he wasn't pushing me back. Okay. He was a little more patient. And then I fell, uh, just when he pushed back just a little bit of a resistance, I thought he would be dumber and pursue me more. But he didn't. Uh, but I did lock up an arm bar. I locked everything nice. in position. And it was... And I knew that was my chance. It was like the first, you know, 10 to 30 seconds. Just like once it hit the ground to catch him off guard, mm -hmm. he had really good defense and he slipped out of it. And I felt like how Connor felt in that fight. I was just slowly getting smashed. I was like, okay, well, I've got guard. I've got this. And he didn't give a fuck mm. about the guard. And even though it didn't look like somebody was beating the shit out of me, I was slowly drowning in my own exhaustion. And that's what happened to Connor. Yeah. 
Yeah, man, I, I, I totally agree. That's a big part of Habib's style is just that tight, tight, tight pressure and just wearing you down, wearing you down, just grinding you away. And, and people uh, don't get it, man. It's worse than getting beat up. It's worse than getting punched because if you get punched, you could you get alert and you move away. Mm -hmm. But like that, it's like you're drowning and just yeah. like you're a warrior. You know, you're a guy who's trained to fight and you feel so out of control. Nobody's game plan is, okay, Khabib is going to get me inside control, smash the shit out of my jaw so I can hardly breathe for 30 seconds. Like, you don't feel like you're winning when you're there. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love watching Dominic Cruz. I think he's a great commentator. But in the first round, oh, Connor's not that tired, and he didn't take that much punishment, and he didn't take that much damage, so he'll be fresh. What do you think? Was he fresh in the beginning of round two? Yeah, well, interestingly, uh, so... Uh, Dominic kind of was was had a point there because again, if we look back to uh, the episode on JRE that just came out, that was mm -hmm. somewhat of what Kavanaugh was saying is that if he gets taken down, the plan is not to expend a lot of energy trying to get back up. Uh, okay. And so Dominic, he, uh, I forget the exact wording, but he said something along the lines of, "I think McGregor is kind of rope doping him here." Right? Oh, okay. I so, thought it was more Khabib be being in control. But okay. Well, Khabib was definitely in control, but I think what, at least the way I understood it, I think what Dominic was saying is like, oh, Connor isn't really trying to get back up. He's, you know, just, I'm going to just sit here and I'm going to, you know, work to not get put in a bad position. I'm going to play my, my butterfly guard. I'm going to do what I can do, but I'm not going to really try to force the stand up and I'm just going to let you do your thing and hopefully watch you tire out a bit. And compared to what we've seen other people look like after that first round with Habib on top, I think Connor looked relatively fresh. Did he look as fresh as he would if Habib had never gotten that takedown? No, I don't think so. He did. You can definitely see it affected him. But he looked better after that takedown than Edson Barbosa did. He looked better after that round than Michael Johnson did. Okay, true, true. Yeah, man. I still feel like that's underestimating the smashing game a little bit, and I still think it wore him out more than they they anticipated that it would. Because he looked like he looked pretty fucking exhausted to me after the beginning of first round, and especially for for Connor. Mm -hmm. Like, how fresh is that guy? He's like a maniac. He's like Bruce Lee, just charging in, you know, like getting right in your face, and uh -huh. he. he he stalked him a little bit, but he didn't really get in his face like uh, like he would open up against, I don't know, like Dennis Seaver, like just right. getting right in his face and spin kick and just boom. He didn't get right in his face like he did against Jose Aldo, you know? Oh, wait, no, Jose Aldo, he kind of stood back a little bit like a sensor. He was moving yeah. in and out. Yeah. Who else was he? But he... Okay. Um, so, all right, those are two different opinions there. Then one is that he was kind of like rope-a-doping him. And maybe that was by design, but I think even if that was, like, on purpose, it didn't respect Khabib's ability to suck the life out of him. And I think yeah. it fucked him on the second round. Yeah, I, I no, I totally agree with that. I don't think that it nullified completely the effect of Khabib. Like, no doubt about it, that guy's pressure is insane. And even with Connor's, let's call it rope-a-dope, it still had an effect on him. No doubt about that. Um, I think it was just an issue of attempting to mitigate or minimize as much as possible the effect. Um, what did you, you just mention something that I was going to respond to, but it, the idea has gone in one ear and out the other. Um, but yeah, no, no doubt his ability to get top position and really just grind people away is something very unique and, Connor got to feel that, and it's one of those things that until you feel that person do it, I don't think you really understand what it's about, you know? You don't know. Yeah. I think that's part of the reason the crowd was booing, because it looked boring. Huh? This guy is laying on him, and he's not punching him. Is this fighting or what? Right, right. Um, yeah, it is, dude, because if you're exhausted, and the other person has complete top position, I mean, even look on it like, not to get all geeky and all philosophical about it, but... What the hell would that look like if there was no rounds and nobody stood him back up and it was a street brawl? Right. Eventually, the guy would just get exhausted, and even if you're not tough, the other guy's exhausted, and you're on the, the dominant position, you could pick and choose whatever you want to do. It's right. It's terrifying. It's horrible.
horrifying. It's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, you describe it very well when you say it feels like drowning. It's one of those, it's a sense of like, just eminent, this is just, I, I can kind of tread water for so long, but it's only a matter of time before I go under. And then people were asking me, like friends were saying, why doesn't Connor punch back? Well, he's on his back, so gravity's against him. Mm -hmm. That's number one. And then number two... Uh, why doesn't he punch back? You could punch, you'll expend a lot of energy, and you're, I can't think of anybody who knocked anybody out from a punch on their back. I mm -hmm. think maybe I saw it once in a highlight, but like, a punch off your back. It's just, it's just game plan. He put him where he wanted to go. Yeah. Check yeah. this out. Okay. Connor's, Connor's game of stalking people, uh -huh. of just not letting them up and just like getting right in their face, you know? Uh -huh. Uh, it works for most guys. It pressures most guys. I think for Khabib, it didn't work for two reasons. Number one, motherfucker is just mentally, he's just like stone cold. Yeah. He's just an animal. I don't even think he cares about his own well-being as much as he cares about like <laughs> killing, hurting other <laughs> people. Uh, but the other thing is, it totally played into Khabib's wrestling. Okay, get closer. I wanted to get closer anyways. Mm -hmm. And almost like a Derek Lewis sort of a thing, throwing back to that fight... I'll interrupt your rhythm when you're coming forward with whatever, mm -hmm. and I'll interrupt that timing with a takedown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is what I love about watching Khabib, and I remember this was such a huge Fedor fan, was uh, I love, you know, when we're at the gym doing kickboxing and boxing, I love doing that. I'm not that rangy, you know, shorter arms, shorter legs, and uh, I was not the most accurate. So I love throwing big shots to try and, like, hurt or confuse the other guy. And then this is what Fader would do, and this is what I feel like uh, Khabib would do, is like just throw some big nasty, you know, like when, when he threw that hit that rocked Connor, mm -hmm. was it some Anderson Silva precise down the pipe, you know, fight genius kind of punch, or was it some nasty like Mike Tyson, maybe street brawler, kind of like open chicken wing kind of, it was just like wide open. Yeah, yeah it, it definitely wasn't a like a nice crisp right hand. You know, and why did um, he do that? Because he knows if I miss, I'm already close, uh -huh. and I'm right down there, and I just go for a takedown afterwards. Uh huh. Well, look at how many wrestlers badass. use that right overhand for that reason exactly. You know, to close the distance. To close the distance, you if you're throwing it with a with a bend, if you're really digging into it, you know, you're dropping level, you're moving forward. If you like, you said, if you miss it, you can easily carry that takedown. momentum into a takedown. You know, and it's one of those things where the person on the receiving end has to think, you know, is this going to be a drop of level for an overhand or is this going to be a drop of level for a takedown? And to your point with Connor, you know, not really being as aggressive as we thought, I think there was two things here. Going back to the interview uh, Joe Rogan was having with Kavanaugh, uh, is Kavanaugh said, looking back in hindsight, I think we took too much of a defensive game plan. We should have been more offensively minded. So the game plan may have been to be a little less offensive. But I think an even bigger portion of it is whenever you have a guy who's that good in comparison to the person who he's fighting with takedowns, you'll uh -huh. see them land shots. You'll see them be able to do things with striking that they shouldn't technically be uh -huh. able to do. Because the fear of the takedown the of the diminishes takedown. the striker so much. Because now I have to... Anderson Silva. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, now I have to worry about the takedown. So I'm not going to be as committed as freely as I would. And then whenever I see you drop level, I got to get ready to drop my guard to stuff the takedown. And that opens up things for striking. And so I think uh, we saw that with Habib being able to land that big overhand right. And we saw mm -hmm. that affecting Connor's willingness to really engage and just let go on the feet. Really, I, I don't think people understand the intelligence that Khabib comes at, at it with. And mm -hmm. it's not the most exciting fighting style. And I used to hate that kind of, oh, this lane prey, what is this shit? And I could understand that fans don't like it, but... Mm -hmm. That's the other thing that I'm getting at is not just seeking for a takedown and then punching instead or vice versa, but also how did it look like magic? How is he hitting this 
you know, wonderfully elusive fighter who's mm-hmm. lying on his feet, and his game is striking. How did he pull that magic off? That was, I think that was, like, really early in the second round, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Connor was slow as fuck and flat-footed as fuck compared to how he always is because he wore him out and confused him, tired him, and maybe emotionally wore him out a little bit mm-hmm. by putting him on his back. Mm-hmm. Well, now, it, this is interesting. Oh, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. It's all good. It's all good. We also have to consider what did that two-year layaway do? You know, how much ring uh, rust was involved in that time off? Uh, uh, maybe he took his focus away from kicks. He could have had more kicks. Possibly. And, you know, just being sharp. Just, you know, you, you do something and then you say, okay, I'm going to not do it for two years. You know, it, there, there's kind of a, a learning curve to get back to that peak level uh, of crispness. And I think, you know, to some extent... Uh, I, I would bet money, if I had to bet money, I would bet money that even with a sharp McGregor, Habib would have still have won. But, you know, just little things. Your timing is off. Your your movements aren't quite there. And Habib has been pretty uh, consistent, and he's been fighting, and he's been pretty active. So I think that definitely had something to do with it. But at the end of the day, I think Habib was just the better fighter. And to go back to something Chel Sonnen said in one of his interviews, or not one of his interviews, one of his... uh videos that he has on his channel is you know he was like look uh you have seen this story many 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 times over we just saw this twice this year with Nganu versus Stipe and with Woodley versus Till the wrestler how many times have we seen it in the sport of MMA where you have this you know fearsome striker who is going up against a guy with great takedowns but you know fair to midland striking and the the grappler just outdoes the striker you know we've seen that story over and over and over again and this was another example of that I I agree completely because if you do your wrestling and you and you pull it off successfully, mm-hmm. especially after a round of just getting grinded out. That striker is more flat-footed. He's heavier. He's you know he's been he's tired. He's not as like elusive and bouncy and springy, and getting out of the way and snapping his punches and everything. It, yeah, I, I think wrestling. If you do it correctly and you're not afraid to get hit on the way in, and you know that when I charge in, I'll get hit, but it won't be a, a clean shot if I'm interrupting the rhythm. Mm-hmm. Which I think is pretty damn cool for self-defense, because most people on the street are not going to be Muhammad fucking Ali, like laser <laughs> precision. Right. So as long as you take the guy down, especially on the street, they don't know who the fuck knows how to get up. Right. Bunch of tough people out there. But how many people know how to get up from off their back? It's like you start narrowing it down to like 10%. Right. And if you have a good top game, even if they do know that and they do know jiu-jitsu, two equally skilled jiu-jitsu guys put one on the back, they'll get tired. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I think he underestimated how much that wrestling was going to suck the life out of him a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I definitely I, think you're I'm right. I'm no MMA genius, but I think it actually would have been better to spring back and really frantically get away from that takedown because as Khabib is chasing him Connor could still be fresh and explode with just a little bit of energy and still be fresh but yeah. it actually like just drain the life out of him he could have been more fresh and more on his seat and more in and out if okay he's going to take me down a couple times and get back up really quick and right. then maybe punish him once I stand up or punish him on the way down or something that's the other thing is there was no was there any answer back from Connor don't do this every time you do this I'm gonna you know punch your nose or I'm gonna like slice your face open on the way down or anything like that's what Anderson Silva was doing to uh, back to Chael Sonnen you know mm-hmm. elbows from the bottom something to answer back to mm-hmm. discourage him from doing that nothing yeah he, he really didn't have anything offensively off of his back there were a couple times when they were in the clinch and uh Habib was looking for the takedown where Connor was trying to, you know, throw some little pot shots or some elbows, but they weren't really having any stopping power, you know? It wasn't enough to to really dissuade uh Habib from continuing with what he's doing. No, yeah, you'd have to you'd have to discourage that guy that anytime mm-hmm. you take me down your face is gonna get sliced up. 
or you might eat a knee in the face and might end it all. You know, you have to like put that fear in him or else he's going to do it. Right. Right. And he really didn't do that. So maybe the advice that they gave him fucked him over a little bit where you should be a little urgent. Mm -hmm. And you should either do something, get right back and knock him real hard. Because, dude, Connor, you're the genius on your feet. You could throw some kicks. You could throw some punches. They'd come out too fast for him to even interpret when they're coming if you were fresh. Right. Uh, you're going to waste a little energy? Okay, well, you know how to dance around. And that's the other thing I don't get. It's like, why not dance around against takedowns and why not be a little more tentative with distance yeah i I think it was a mistake to stalk and chase khabib down because khabib did a really good like kind of rope a dope playing possum like oh i don't like this up takedown he Mm -hmm. loved it when he closed the distance it's less work for him you know that's an interesting point because i'll say going into this fight you know one of the points that i for both fighters that i thought they would have to do is apply pressure um, we've, we've seen Habib kind of in all his fights look his best when he's moving forward and the guy is backing up, backing away towards the cage, can't really throw any power shots because they're retreating, worried about the takedown, and then mm-hmm. Habib just turns into that snowball that's building momentum. And so going <laughs> into the fight, I was like, okay, it may be wise for Conor to keep pressure on him, but in doing so, utilize a lot of lateral movement. And that's something he didn't do. He stood in front of him. If you go back and you watch the Michael Johnson fight, Michael Johnson did well for the first like minute and 50 seconds and like the first minute and a half of the first and second round because he used a lot of uh, lateral movement, left and right, a lot of quick hand combinations, and a lot of straights to the body to try to maintain that distance. And I think that's what allowed... uh, Johnson to kind of apply some pressure but the type of pressure that Connor was applying was I'm going to stand in front of you and apply pressure as opposed to using lateral movement and I think think that cost him. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's all ego and it's great that he's that confident. I mean, how did he look like his face and his his posture, he looked very like, I mean, at least maybe he was faking it but at the beginning of the second round he looked like a confident person. Mm-hmm. And he looked like, I know how to do this shit. I've been here a million times. But he was slow and he was flat-footed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you got to give it, I mean, his confidence is incredible. I think that's a part of it. It's like, even if you can do something, you're not going to do it if you don't believe you could. So that's incredible. The other thing, talking about just mental toughness, how about fucking um, Khabib just standing right in front of Connor? Are you kidding me? Like, that was pretty incredible. How dangerous Connor is on the feet. Yeah, I I was was super surprised by that. I was very, very surprised and impressed. I didn't think he would stand in front of him. And then if he did, I was like, oh, well, for sure he's just going to get lit up. And the fact that he, not only did he get a knockdown, right, but he actually landed more strikes. He landed more significant strikes. And now, to be fair, a lot of those strikes were gained in the ground and pound. Okay. But if you go back and if you look at the card, he won in he won in every aspect. He got a ta- he got more takedowns. He maintained dominant position from uh, from the top. He landed a higher number of strikes and he landed oh, more yeah. significant strikes. And oh, he dude, was it able was slow and methodical domination. Absolutely, it may have not been as exciting to watch as like when Connor wins. But yeah, mm-hmm. he was just slowly working what he wanted to do for sure. Yeah, man. Yeah, and it, it just he just he did his thing. He worked his game mm-hmm. plan, and Connor just didn't have the answer for it on that night. And to be honest with you, you know they're talking about a rematch potentially. Uh, I don't know that Connor will have an answer on the next night. You know, it would look very similar. I think so. I think just very similar. The level of takedown and top control that Habib has is just too far advanced for for Connor to catch up to. That stylistic matchup just does not work in his favor. I know. Check this out. Okay, check this out. You have two guys. One is really good at striking. He's got like the touch of death punch or kick or both, whatever. And then you've got another guy who's really good at takedowns. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, with like accuracy and aiming, how much more difficult is it to aim and, you know, guys like Connor, especially Connor, just incredible accuracy 
But what's easier to score? Like, what's easier to aim? What's more likely to happen? Is to close the distance and get a clinch or to land that beautiful shot? Yeah. And the opportunities for takedowns are just so much. You don't have to aim as much. You just have to be low enough and you have to be, you know, have your arms there to, like, to grab his legs, like, and his whole body needs to be there. But, like, a punch is, like, this narrow, like, trying to hit, like, a, a cue ball with a pool cue. It's, like, a little more accurate. You know, the opportunities aren't there. So, like, just the odds of, you know, one guy's got the magic punch, one guy's got relentless takedowns. You know, it's almost like that old school Gracie thing. Like, the clutch mm-hmm. is, is inevitable. It's eventually going to the ground, and I'm just more, you know, geeky, more nerdy on the ground, so you're going to fucking pay for it there. Right. Right. I think that's what it would look like, is eventually Khabib will take a few shots, but they won't be direct because he'll be moving around and eventually get the takedown that he needs. Yeah, I, I think, you know, with maybe maybe minor variation, it would more or less look the same. Um, now we're coming up soon on an hour and ten, so I want to make sure before we get off, we do get a chance to touch on the wildness, the aftermath after Habib gets his uh, his submission, the jumping over the fence brawl with Dylan Dennis, the guys, uh, his teammates jumping in and getting into it with Connor. What was your thoughts on all of that, man? Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to how to say it because I want to you know keep respect for the sport but it was definitely interesting like it made me it made me really want to watch the next main event or if these guys ever fight again or Uh any press conference between like just hyped it up like so crazy it was you know it's not sportsman like and that's not what MMA is all about but shit that was so exciting that uh, this guy won a fight against the best fighter in the world besides him and after fighting a hard fought fight he goes jumps over the fence to fight another guy it's like when will it be enough when will he be satisfied (laughs) right that reminded me of uh, Brock Lesnar and Frank Mir when he smashed the shit out of Frank Mir's face and he's still screaming at him and stuff but at least Brock Lesnar didn't go back and start attacking Frank Mir right right well, I, I, there's there's a lot to unpack, I think, in that scenario. Um, Wait, real quick, real quick. Why was he talking shit to Dylan Dennis? The only thing I could think of is, where's this jujitsu motherfucker? I just choked him. Where's this jujitsu, right? It was something like that. I, I So, we haven't really gotten any clear audio, so I can only, I can only uh, pontificate as to what the exchanges were but or who said it first or whatever what I've been hearing from Joe Rogan and other people uh, I think um, Dominic Dominic Cruz might have said something along this line Uh, during the fight Dylan Dennis was talking shit to Khabib uh, while they were fighting I don't know if this is true but this is just kind of what I've heard mentioned is Dylan Dennis was talking shit you know while they were fighting Dylan Dennis was kind of running his mouth and trolling leading up to the fight in interviews and, you know, I'll choke uh, Habib out, you know, I'm a better version of Habib, uh, so on and so on and so forth. Um, And then something was being said or done, uh, according to Kavanaugh in his interview with Joe Rogan, he said he was standing right next to Dylan Dennis and he didn't hear him saying anything. But he, you know, Dennis may have been, you know, I don't know, flicking him the bird or doing something to like fuck you and try to instigate some shit. Oh, not God, expecting yeah. that this fucking Dagestani monster was gonna hop the <laughs> fence and, you know, like you ever see in the movies when the Incredible Hulk leaps across a building, just jump oh, yeah. over a row or two of people to come smash him. <laughs> you know, I don't think he was expecting that. And, uh,. He did look a little, yeah, he looked a little shocked. Did he eat any punches from Khabib, or were there enough people that got between them, and they were trying to throw flurries, but nobody really punched each other? Yeah, I don't think anything landed flush. Um, Mm. I I did see some punches being thrown, but it looked more like, you know, just stuff was thrown, nothing really landed too clean. They kind of clinched up a bit, and then people started pulling them apart, and I think some a, a punch or two was landed as they were being pulled apart, but nothing, uh-huh. nothing that you know looked fresh or clean. I know Chel uh-huh. Sonnen uh, said in his post-fight 
uh, commentary that he saw Dylan Dennis being escorted out looking a little bit wobbly. Uh, it was either Chel Sonnen or or uh, what's yeah, the what's the British uh, dude um, with the wonky Bisping? eye? Bisping. Uh, Bisping. Yeah, one of them was commentating that he looked a little wobbly as he's being escorted out, but I'm not sure if that's true or not. But for it the could most have been part, like emotional too. Maybe, maybe. For the most part, it didn't really look like a real fight as much as more of a scuffle. Um, and then, of course, there was the whole Connor and his, and his and Habib's team. And right after the fight, everybody was expecting, okay, Habib's team just ran in and jumped Connor. But they've reviewed some footage from different angles. And actually, uh -huh. Connor threw the first punch against Habib's team. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I actually saw it. So it was, uh, so Connor's there just exhausted and disappointed, obviously. Probably, mm -hmm. like, just, like, uh, shocked, you know? And then he kind of sees what's going on. Maybe he doesn't really know exactly what's going on or who, but uh, he knew that Khabib ran over there to attack somebody from his side, like his buddy. I don't know if it was specifically Dennis. So he saw Khabib go over there, and he probably just saw not exactly what was going on, but the insanity. I mean, the insanity, and like that's your buddy, you know, like mm -hmm. that's your buddy getting beat up or attacked or whatever. And then he saw the other Khabib guys jump the fence. So as the Khabib guy was jumping the fence, one of the bouncer guys held him halfway, so he was kind of stuck. And then Connor started punching him from the ground up at the fence. The other guy threw the hammer fist down. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, was Connor being a dick, just punching some guy who was running by, or was he protecting his buddy? Yeah, I, I, I don't like, know. How does the law see that? I don't know. I don't know. Let's say morally, how far you can judge Connor on that, because, like you said, okay, obviously my teammate is getting attacked. I'm moving in that direction. And the team members from the guy attacking my teammate are also moving in that direction. Now, we don't know whether Habib's team is going there to try to break it up. We don't know whether Habib's team is going to, over there to jump Dylan Dennis. But it's within the realm of plausibility for McGregor to see this guy hopping the fence as well. And either thinking he's trying to catch me or he's trying to go help jump my buddy. And so, look, the brawl has broken out. And once the brawl breaks out, you know, shit starts hitting the fan. So I don't that know. That was really low, dude, when they fucking, like, punching him on the back of the head and shit. Like, man. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that you can necessarily br uh, blame McGregor for that. Uh, but I think it is important to differentiate the narrative that it was just uh, Habib's team just jumping in and just mauling him out of nowhere or assaulting him out of nowhere. Um, it is quite possible that had McGregor not thrown that punch that they would not have jumped the fence to attack him. But ultimately, we won't, we'll never know. Um, something that I thought was a, an interesting point here was the difference in culture between the two. Between McGregor and Habib, right? And why a lot of this, like why this animosity built up to a point where Habib was willing to go overboard and take it to that level. Um, if you look, the, and you can find these videos all over YouTube. There are the Irish traveler call-out videos for the you know the Irish bare knuckle boxers, and they call somebody out, and quite entertaining. But it's clearly a part of that culture where you call somebody out, you start insulting their honor, you talk shit about their family, you talk crap about them, you guys, you kind of you know put some social pressure for them to come fight you. You guys have your bout. You shake your hands at the end of it, and then what's done is done. And I think that's part of why Connor is as good as he is at that game is because there's a cultural precedent set for that from where he comes from. On the flip side, you look at Habib and you look at where he comes from. One, just Eastern European culture in general has this vibe of like, we don't take no shit. Very... A, a honor society in the sense that you cannot disrespect uh, somebody and there not be consequences. And Habib comes from a place that's a literal war-torn country and comes from a place where, you know, people that you know are getting shot, people that you know are getting killed. And it's not like here where, oh, I'll just call the police and they'll handle violence for me. Like having the reputation of I don't let people cross the line with me 
kind of is your protection because then it yeah, keeps the line. wolves away. They know, ah, you can't cross the line with that dude because he'll come fuck you up or he'll go crazy. So we'll go find another victim. And I think that is a part of Habib's mentality where you cannot let people get away with certain things. And then you add on top of that the whole uh, bus and dolly incident. Again, you're dealing with a dude who comes from a place where people die and get killed on the regular. And you got somebody coming with 30 or 40 goons and start throwing shit through the window. That doesn't come across as like, oh, we're just going to fight and shake hands now. Like you've brought things to a very, very different level at that point. And I think the fact that he was able to kind of hold his cool and just, you know, bite his tongue and swallow everything. And the fact that there was no repercussion from the UFC. There was legal repercussions uh, on the legal side outside of the UFC for Connor. But on the UFC's end, there was no real repercussion for that type of behavior or a lot of the other crazy behavior that he's had. And so I think uh, Habib just kind of sat on it and was like, all right, all right, I'm not going to do anything to jeopardize the fight. But once the fight's done, you know, something has to be done for this. And the UFC probably isn't going to punish me for it, at least not too severely, based on the leniency that they've had with Connor. Yeah. Or with the gaming commission or whatever, that he'll just keep coming back because he makes so much money when he talks all that shit and gets everybody riled up. Yeah, I don't think Khabib understands that, but also, well, maybe he doesn't understand it. Maybe he also doesn't care. Just like right, you cross the. This goes beyond fighting. This goes beyond the pride of who won the fight or who's making more money or whatever. It just goes into like honor and pride, like this very old school. Thing. I, I think that's pretty cool. It's, it's great what Connor's doing, and it's great all the attention that he brought to the sport. But I really feel like uh, I can relate a little bit more to the quiet guy who I don't talk shit, but go and try it and just let's see what happens. You know, I don't say anything about you or your mama or any of this shit. Uh, but yeah, if I'm not insulted by anything, but if you physically come after me, then it's gonna. You might even kill me, but it's gonna be a long ass night for you. You know, like right. That's pretty fucking badass. I don't think a lot of American viewers can identify with that. You know, we want to think that the guy who wins the fight is, like, cocky, and we love personalities like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's great. You know, it's cool, and it's a spectacle, but I kind of relate a little more with the Khabib kind of personality where, like, I'm just quiet, and I might even be, like, playing possum a little bit. I might even look, less, you know, more unassuming to bait you if you're a bully or if you go kicking up things you know like you're gonna fucking find something that you don't want to find you know and that right. was kind of the storm that he unleashed was uh, this is what you get you know it felt very personal yeah man it definitely did brother well look we're coming up on an hour and 20 minutes let's go ahead and wrap this up man uh, it was awesome having you on I appreciate you com coming on brother I enjoyed doing this with you thank you everybody for listening and watching and uh, stay tuned for episode 25, which will be coming up in the near future. Peace out. Looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. No problem, brother.